This is Living Waters of Grace, the teaching ministry of Clark Lawfer, Senior Pastor of Calvary Chapel of Westmoreland County of Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Now here's Pastor Clark as he continues teaching through God's Word. We are to be completely different people than we were before we knew Jesus. Whenever Jesus came into our life and he saved us and he and he rocked our world and he changed everything about how we perceive life, how we think about life, how we experience life, is that we walk in a, a dimension that's completely brand new. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Today, Pastor Clark will be reminding you that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. All believers have died with Christ and no longer live for themselves. Our lives are no longer worldly. They are now spiritual. Our death is that of the old sin nature, which was nailed to the cross with Christ. It was buried with him. And just as he was raised up by the Father, so are we raised up to walk in newness of life. Remember, you've been translated from darkness to light. Now here's Pastor Clark in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 as he begins his message, Trophies of Grace. Well, as we look at these verses, one of the the things that I think sticks out to me at least as I prepared for this is that Uh, The name of the message is Trophies of Grace. And whenever you were a kid and you competed in sports or some kind of athletic uh, program or something you've done in your life, maybe some of you have received trophies for what it was that you did. And you put them on a shelf and you remember nostalgically, hey, I remember when I hit that home run or I hit that basket or whatever. It gives you a a remembrance of uh, how you were able to be used in some capacity in your life to make a difference, maybe on a team or a situation or uh, a family. And in God's economy, he calls us uh, vessels of grace. And every one of us are on display, whether we realize it or not. Every day, every second of our life, every decision we make, every move we take, people are watching us. And the goal that the Father has for all of us is that whenever we live our lives, people would see Jesus in us. And There's no reason why they can't see him in us because he lives in us by the power of his spirit. But sometimes we we impede the presence and the power of God by our own self-centeredness, our own bitterness, our own indifference at times. So there can be people around us, even in our own home and families at times, that we're not reflecting the character of Jesus in our lives. So that's sort of the focus of what we're going to look at today. And I just wanted to do a little bit of review from the last couple weeks. It says in verse 5, of chapter 2 of Ephesians, that Christ has raised us up. We were dead in trespasses, but we were made alive together with Christ. And then in parentheses, it says, by grace, you have been saved. In Romans chapter 3, verse 24, it tells us that we've been justified freely, no costs, uh, nothing any of us could earn. We've been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, in the New Testament, this word grace comes from the Greek word charis, which means undeserved favor from God. In the Old Testament, the uh, similar word used in the Old Testament is hesed. It means speaking of God's loving kindness, mercy, and faithfulness. And so God has done incredible things for every one of us here today who are believers. And I think at times we take lightly the grace of God. We don't comprehend the grace of God because in the earth economy or the system we live in, everything that we accomplish is done by our own work and our own ability. Our jobs, our relationships, everything that has to do with our health, we have to work at certain things in order to get the desired outcome. But in regard to the kingdom of heaven, there is no work for you and me to do. The work has been done by the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of all those who believe. 
Now, in the Greek culture at that time, whenever there was extreme generosity given or shown to others, it demanded loyalty on the part of the recipient. And so your loyalty and my loyalty in regard to what Christ has done for us is something we need to consider. Uh, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body, that's what we're wearing today, this body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. So God lives in us by the person of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God, and you're not your own. In other words, we don't belong to ourselves anymore for Christians. If we, we've been saved, we actually belong to God. And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So I don't know about you, but the first thing I usually think about when I get my lazy bones out of bed in the morning and I'm looking for my Starbucks or my coffee is, oh, I got to get my coffee in order to survive or whatever. But God wants me to realize the first thing I need to comprehend when I get up is that God lives in me and he's going to give me the strength to do whatever it is that's set before me in the day ahead. And my mind takes a little while to wake up to begin to realize that. It dawns on me again that God lives in me and he wants to live through me. Someone once said that God has to first work in you before he can work through you. And so it tells us then as we move along in this review in verse 6 that he also raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when, when we were raised up to live and walk with the Lord Jesus after our salvation, we are to walk in newness of life. In other words, we are to be completely different people than we were before we knew Jesus. Whenever Jesus came into our life and he saved us and he, and he rocked our world and he changed everything about how we perceive life, how we think about life, how we experience life, is that we walk in a, a dimension that's completely brand new. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so we're to walk in newness of life. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, and he died for all, that's Jesus dying for us, that those who live, that's us right now, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The privilege you and I have to reflect Jesus to other people is magnificent. If we're out of the way and we're dead to ourselves and we're denying ourselves, as Jesus said we're to do, if any man will follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, the actual life of Jesus will shine through us. He will live through our lives to minister and touch people in ways that you and I never could in our humanness. The supernatural God dwells in every one of us as believers, and I don't think that dawns on us many times. We, In our mind, we think, well, the Lord, you're, sitting, you're on the right hand of the Father. I'm here. I'm living my life. Yeah, okay, your Holy Spirit's in me, and, and I, I believe that. But how does that work, or how does, how does that manifest itself in my, in my daily life? Because I know in my own life, my life so often is in the way of what God's life intends to be seen in me. And so it sets us up for verse 7 as we really begin uh, the study today, that this is the purpose of God, that in the ages to come, not only in the future, but actually what's happening right now in this present moment, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Exceeding riches. This is wealth without measure. This is an unlimited supply of grace that can never run dry. It's there available for me and you 24-7 every day of our life, here and throughout all eternity. And this is God's perspective and his desire and his will that in the ages to come, He's going to have all of us in the throne room of heaven together. And we're going to look just like Jesus. We're going to be perfected and be just like him. We won't be able to point the finger at one another and say, well, I'm more like Jesus than you, or we're not going to have that kind of ego. 
We're not going to be insultive of other people or critical or condemning other people. We're going to be just like the Lord. And whenever he displays us in the eons of all eternity, every day he will receive grace and glory and honor because of all that he's done in and through each of our lives, what he's transformed us into, what he's made us like unto him. Whenever you read this and you think about this riches of his grace, it's rooted in the fact that God is kind. That name of Jesus represents his kindness and so many other things, that he's been kind toward you and me. And so you ask yourself today, as I do, as I read this, as I study this, as I teach on this, how much grace is available to you today and to me? Unlimited grace. Grace without measure. Whenever you and I interact with people in life every day, and even in the home, and with the kids and the marriage or the, or the work relationships we have, we're not used to uh, maybe getting unlimited grace from one another. We might give grace a little bit here and there, but after a while, like, well, I've forgiven you one too many times. I'm not going to do that anymore. No more grace for you. And you might want to remind whoever was saying that for you, well, well, God isn't like that. Well, <laughs> I know he isn't, but I'm not like God. Well, God wants us to be like him. He wants us to rely upon him so that that flow of unlimited grace that dwells within us and we've received flows out of us to all those who desperately need this kind of grace. Now, sometimes we'll look at a situation in someone's life about a sin issue or a weakness or a character flaw, whatever, we all have them. And we'll think, well, I'll give grace to you if your sin isn't really bad. Or if you really grovel and really say, I'm really, really sorry. And you might think, well, I might forgive you, but you got to grovel a little bit more. You got to prove that you're really sorry for what it is you did. And then I might consider forgiving you. Aren't you glad that you don't have to grovel before God? That that grace is unconditional? That you never will go to the Lord and, and ask for mercy and ask for forgiveness and ask for grace where he'll ever say, yeah, there's no more grace. You've out, uh, you know, there's, there's just none available anymore. You've used it all. Your allocation of grace in this life is over and there's no more, no more grace left for you. That'll never happen. It'll never happen. And how unlike we are in the natural as humans to be that way toward others. Whenever we're living this life, and, and I think, you know, the first illustration of it for me is towards Cindy or Cindy toward me, that when you live with someone for 45 years, you're married to them for 45 years, you know everything about them. You know the things that still drive you crazy. You know the things that you'll never, ever change in that person. And you know the things in your own life that are difficult and you've struggled with your whole life. But there's this element, I think, in a, in a Christian home, whenever we're recipients of this tremendous grace of God, personally ourselves, how can we not give grace to other people? And the whole picture of this illustration here in Ephesians today is that this is God's perfect will that we would be trophies of grace because everybody in this world needs grace and there's so little of it to be found anywhere. It's uh, not predictable to find grace in this life, in this world. It's definitely not a reality to find grace in the lives of people that don't know Jesus. And the world is conditioned upon effort and work and evidence of accomplishments before someone will even consider you as being a legitimate, real human being. Because everybody has expectations of everybody else in this life. And if we don't meet those expectations, then there's no more uh, availability of grace, at least in us, towards someone else. And that's not the way God has wired us as his kids to walk in newness of life. I think of, of the grace of God in Psalm 51, and it's my favorite psalm because it speaks to my own life and to really everyone's life who's ever committed any kind of sin that has been serious. And it doesn't have to be adultery or murder like it was for David. It can be a host of other things that have disturbed your life and have ruined your life and have caused you to 
actually realize you need saved because of what you had been through in your life. But I love how David approaches the Lord God. He starts out in verse one. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Already David knows that God is a God of loving kindness. There was no doubt in David's mind that this was not the character of God. He had committed adultery with Bathsheba and he had committed murder of Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband. Serious weight and burden of sin upon his life. But he knew the one to go to and to cry out to. Have mercy upon me, O God, based upon your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. That's a man who's broken, who has an attitude, who knows he's in deep in his life because of the decisions he made. He feels abandoned, he's broken, he's overwhelmed, he's sorrowful, but he knows the character of God. And as we study the book of Ephesians, I, I really emphasized mercy last week in a very personal way myself of how much I need mercy and how much mercy God has given me over and over and over and over and over again. And I need not only mercy, but I need God's grace over and over and over again. And God has never once not extended to me grace. But as I study this and I'm reminded of God's grace, I'm also aware of the fact that how often I was not willing to give grace to others and mercy to others. It's like the man who owed the debt in the Gospels. And Jesus represents the ruler and the judge of this situation. And the man asked for mercy. And the man who the debt was owed to said to him, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to pay your debt and I'm going to free you. And that's what God has done for you and me when he's forgiven us of our sins, right? And then time goes on and this man's uh, taken advantage of by someone else who has a far less debt. And he asks this man now who has just been forgiven a great debt to forgive him of his small debt. And the man basically wants to choke him and tell him, uh, if you don't pay me, you're going to be thrown into the prison and never be released. And never have uh, opportunity to ever see the light of day again. And that shows us how potentially wicked our heart is apart from the grace of God. And whenever the first judge heard what this man did, there was great judgment upon the man that only had a little bit of debt that needed to be paid. The Bible, I think, teaches us that if we've experienced great forgiveness and great mercy and great love, then we are to be that way toward other people, right? And that's what attracts people to the person of Jesus Christ. And God's grace has covered for many of us here, and some of us are, I'm sure if we gave a, a list of all of our sins we committed, categorize them, your pastor would probably be the worst in here. But God chose the Apostle Paul, and he was a murderer of Christians. He said he was the chief of sinners. And I think God chooses people to serve him who have been forgiven much. Because we have a good, good news message, right, to tell the masses of humanity that if God has forgiven me, he truly can forgive you for what you have done. But he has the grace, our God, to forgive us of the most horrific sin. And back to Psalm 51, David's murder and adultery as a king of Israel. And because of his sin, he brought tremendous heartache upon himself and his family and the whole nation of Israel. But he didn't have to come begging to God for grace. He repented of his sin, and he was able to receive the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God that was made possible because of the Messiah who was to come. And we, as we look at the Messiah and what he's done for us, every one of us today, for the most part here today as believers, all of us as believers have received this magnificent grace. And God does not limit his grace because his grace is unlimited to his children all of us who have been saved by his grace. His grace is excellent. It's excelling. 
It's surpassing. It's exceeding. It's beyond all measure. Remember that old hymn? We used to sing it in some of the old churches. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Remember that? Grace that is greater than all our sin. How blessed we are. And if we've received this grace, we understand this grace. And so he's talking about this idea in verse 7 of showing the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And so I'm on demonstration today before you as you are before me and before one another that we are to display to others the full measure of this grace that the Lord Jesus has granted to us. Our lives are to demonstrate to all these people in this world that we pass every day, the people we work with, the people we live with, the people we live by, the people we work with. Wherever we go, our lives are to demonstrate to other people the possibility of this same grace we've received is readily, readily available to them through Jesus Christ. Amen? And what's exciting about this, your life is like a, a magnet of grace. And when you're walking in the power of God's Spirit and His grace is full of, in your heart and you're mind blown every day of His grace and His patience with you and His mercy, you're that way to other people. And when you're out in the commonplace of the world, and people run into you and they interact with you and they respond to you and they see how you are. They've never really met anybody like you before, perhaps. I mean, there is such a minority influence in this world of grace today. And everyone needs desperately to experience grace. And you may be the only one on display to show forth God's grace to that one person that needs the grace of God. Someone told me a story this morning. This person was on a bicycle, and he saw this man. He said, excuse me, sir, may I speak with you? And the guy said, sure, I'll, I'll talk with you. And so he went around a corner, and the guy's thinking, does this guy have a gun? What's he going to do, shoot me or whatever? And, and, the, and the young man, he's a high school student at a local high school, and he, he told this man that he was been bullied by people. And he had not a great relationship in home, and his life is really in shambles. And this man shared the gospel of God's grace with this young man, and this young man asked Jesus to save him. God's grace, someone standing out in front of the church, just enjoying the weather. God's grace, sending that young man by on a bicycle that was looking for an answer. God's grace. And the majority of human beings on the face of the planet need to be drawn to someone that they can see hope and grace and mercy within their lives. You know, when we get saved, it tells us in Romans 8, 28, everything, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his mercy. In verse 29, it says, for those he did foreknow, he did predestinate to become conformed to the image and likeness of his son. So every crisis, every heartache, every tragedy, everything that goes wrong is allowed by God to make us broken and desperate for God's grace so that we become recipients of that grace. And then we're able to go out and manifest that grace to other people because and wherever he went, grace flooded out of Jesus. And that's why people were attracted to him. What you've heard today is just one message from the book of Ephesians with Pastor Clark here on Living Waters of Grace. If you're new to this program, we have two pastors who alternate teachings. And Pastor Clark and Pastor Lewis also teach at Calvary Chapel, Westmoreland in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. If you're interested in hearing more messages like this one, head on over to calvarychapelonline.com and find the Listen tab. We trust that what you've heard here on the radio will make an impact on your everyday life. Calvary Chapel, Westmoreland is located at 207 Hudson Street in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. If you're in the area, we'd love to see you this Sunday at 1030 a.m. Head over to our website, calvarychapelonline.com for more information. 
we offer a live stream of the service for those who live further away. We also wanted you to be aware that if you're in the Greensburg area, you can listen to Grace FM on the new 91.7 frequency. Please pray about helping support the new station that will reach thousands more listeners. If God has placed it on your heart to support this new station, feel free to send gifts to Grace FM, P.O. Box 716, Greensburg, Pennsylvania, 15601. Thanks for considering this opportunity and thanks for listening today. There's so much to look forward to as Pastor Clark continues to teach through Ephesians, a letter written by Paul. If you're ever in a place where you feel like no one can relate to unjust suffering while taking a stand for Christ, Paul can. His experience is something to hold on to. Before we go, we just want to express our gratitude for our time with you today on Living Waters of Grace. 